Charged Up Episode 18, How to Finance a Trip Around the World with Guinness World Record Holder Cassie DePeckle. Are you ready to get charged up about your money, your credit, and your overall financial health? You've come to the right place. You're listening to Charged Up with Jenny Hoff. Welcome to Charged Up. I'm Jenny Hoff, a managing editor at creditcards.com, where we have dozens of columns and stories and videos on how to travel using credit card points and budgeting. As a travel junkie myself, I am so excited to talk with our guest today, Guinness World Record holder Cassie DePeckle, the youngest woman and youngest American to visit every country in the world at 27 years old, and the world record holder for visiting all 196 countries in the shortest amount of time. By the way, she visited every one of these countries all by herself. Now, before you think, well, she must have inherited a nice fortune to make that happen, listen up. Cassie was a babysitter in a small town when she decided to undertake this voyage. But she had a dream, and she knew that if she worked hard enough and strategized enough, she could make that dream a reality. She's now in a position to help others fund their expeditions, and she's also giving seminars on how to finance passion projects, no matter how big or small. Today, she's going to share some of her tips with us, from which credit cards were most useful on the road, to how she budgeted, to how she built a following and a group of supporters willing to help her finance her expedition. Of course, she'll give us travel tips as well. So if you have big dreams and just don't know where to start, then sit back and get charged up about learning how to finance a trip around the world. Cassie, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm glad we were able to get our time zone synced to make this happen. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So there's a lot I want to talk to you about. You've had such an incredible experience that I know many of us wish we could experience even part of that. Now, we put a call out for questions from our listeners who are very anxious for your travel tips. But first, can you tell me about how this goal came to be and how you initially made a plan to travel the world as quickly as possible happen? Yeah, so I just, I always kind of had this desire to want to change the world. And, you know, I didn't know how I was going to go about doing so. So at the age of 21, I, you know, I had a semester left of college and I left to go travel kind of with my brother for a month around about four countries in Europe. And when we were traveling together, he was like, why don't we spend the longest amount of time in like a couple countries. How about we spend like the least amount of time and go to as many countries in Europe as possible? And at that point, I was like, you know what? I want to go to every single country in the world and I want to make it happen. And I also want to try to change the world in the meantime. So at that time, that's when the idea kind of came came about. And then it was in the back of my mind up until the age of like 24 and a half. I was kind of going through a quarter life crisis and I was like, okay, it's either now or never that I actually apply it and, and do it and just do it. And so then when you said, okay, I'm going to do this, there's a big step between saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to travel to every single country in the world. That means war-torn countries. That means dangerous places. That means far-off places. And financially and kind of emotionally getting ready to do that. So what was your next step once you made that decision? Okay, it's either now or never. How did you strategize and make this happen? Yeah, well, you know, I actually, I didn't have a, a lot to lose. And I was babysitting and I, I knew that that wasn't going to be my career for my life. And, you know, I was just kind of like, you know, renting out a place. I didn't have, a, I was in a relationship or anything. And so I, it was a perfect time for me to go. So I said, you know what, I just have to do it. I have to commit to it. And for me, I had traveled to about 25 countries, been across two years, um, backpacking, working abroad prior to this expedition. So I'd had a lot of travel experience and like solo travel experience specifically. So I thought, you know, I kind of already have the experience I need to take off on this sort of mission. So the travel part of it is, is easy for me, even going to Syria, you know, Afghanistan. For me, I really wanted to dive into the Middle East specifically and kind of war-torn countries. I just always had this desire to showcase the beauty of the people and the cultures as opposed to the bad stuff that we see all the time and we hear all around us. So that was kind of a goal of mine to kind of push aside what, you know, these preconceived notions and really showcase a different side of these, these countries. So once I committed to it, I just, I thought, okay, now I need to find the funding, of course. I need to add the sponsors, the supporters. And it just, it took a year and a half of really hard work obtaining all of the necessary funding and supporters and branding that I needed to in order to take off. Okay. So did you fund this exclusively through supporters and through outside donations, or did you also strategically save up money, use certain credit cards in order to get as many points as possible to get some free travel? Yeah. So I, in that year and a half, I was working those these two babysitting jobs and I was working about 85 hours a week overnight, um, really pushing myself so that I could 
kind of chip away as much as possible and save. And I ended up saving about around $10,000 uh, to get me going for the first few months of the expedition. But in that year and a half, I also obtained sponsors and independent investors because I'm actually filming. I was filming an educational documentary along the way. So between the sponsors and the investors, I was able to fund the whole expedition through them. And that actually took about three years. You know, it was a constant effort to try and keep up with the funding through reaching out to sponsors throughout the, the entire expedition. But with that said, I also did. I used one card in particular throughout my trip that actually two that really did help with points with hotels and flight points as well. I would use them and then it's like if I buy coffee, you know, those I would obtain points and everything, use those towards flights. That did save me a lot on flights as well and accommodation. Which cards were they? They're not a sponsor, so, <laughs> but I'll just stop. <laughs> I'm like, I wish they were a sponsor, but um, the, the, Chase, the Chase Sapphire Refers card um, is the one that really helped out throughout the trip. And I was able to rack up a lot of points with that. And also the IHG MasterCard rewards card. So if there were times when I when I needed to kind of take a break, if I was really sick, I mean, I would kind of treat myself maybe once every couple months. And, and that's where I'd use those points to go towards that. And so I ended up racking up quite a few points with that as well. Okay, so you use these cards basically exclusively for all your expenses along the trip that you would then pay for out of whatever money you had raised. But through using these cards, you were able to rack up a lot of points that would get you free hotel nights and then free travel, planes, etc. using the Chase Sapphire Preferred. Yeah, the Chase I preferred was definitely where I got the most use out of, for sure, even to this day. Let's talk about how you budgeted for this trip. How would you even guess how much it's going to take in order to travel to every country in the world? Especially because I don't know if in some countries did you get security or did you just wing it and say... I'm going to leave this up to the fates and really hope that I make it out okay. Yeah, I, I'm a wing it kind of girl. You know, I'm like, I, there were, I did want security for Yemen and Syria, but it came down to like money. I couldn't afford it. I mean, I think it was $2,000 per hour to hire someone to come in with me. And I was like, you know what? I've gone this far. I've gone through Somalia. I've gotten through Afghanistan. I'm just going to go for it. And that way I can say that I went in alone to all these countries. And I just, it took a lot of courage kind of my side. And that's what I feel really proud of as well. The budgeting was really a challenge initially when I planned the trip in that year and a half, I had, of course, like I had this huge wall map and I planned how to get to each place, the visas involved, you know, the train to get from A to B, you really, really, really detailed to find that funding. And I ended up coming up with a budget of around 198,000 US dollars, including buffer money in case there's an emergency. And that was kind of included in that 198 was you know, airline and hotel and, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the budget. I didn't have that when I left, you know, when I left, I had only a certain amount and I had to keep working to obtain that funding throughout the entire expedition. I mean, at one point, seven months in, I completely ran out of my funding because I thought, oh, you know, I'll just use and it'll come. It'll come. It'll, it'll, those people will reach out to me. Companies will want to sponsor me. No, that's not the case. It, you have to put like an immense amount of work in, you know, every day, every morning, send emails out, be proactive networking using LinkedIn to, to reach out to companies for sponsorship. So when I ran out of money, I, I just, you know, I had to come home for two weeks, Guinness World Record regulations. You, you can't be in one country for more than 14 days. So when I did come home, I had 14 days to rack up some more funding to get back out there. So it's literally, you know, 12, 15 hour work days, just being proactive, trying to find more funding to keep going. And then I realized at that point that I, I just can't stop and hang out and assume it's going to come to me. It ended up being the final budget was around 110000 that I ended up spending for the trip. But that also included the, the airline sponsors, the hotel sponsors. I was sponsored by the tourism board in some countries and Skull International. And so it wasn't all just money. You had some free flights, some free hotels, some free stays. So you weren't having to pay for every single thing that you did there. So let's talk a little bit about what you learned about money management, because I'm sure the attitude you had is babysitting as your jobs, you know, before you went out there to managing your money as you travel around the world, even running out of money and coming back and having to raise more. What were the three probably biggest money management skills that you gained? So so it's really important to keep a an Excel spreadsheet. I never did that before, before this whole expedition. And even like during the expedition, I was really like losing track of my finances at, you know, once that happened about 
six months in and I ran out of money, I was like, you know, I really have to teach myself. And money's never been, a, you know, like math has never been my strong point. So I was like, you know, I really have to teach myself how to keep on top of my, my finances, my budgeting. I have my own business now. And so having an Excel spreadsheet is really important to keep everything intact. And then I would say, you know, save 10%. Just 10% of every paycheck that comes in, that can be used towards travel or, you know, incidentals or whatnot. So always save 10%. Um, and then the third money management, I guess I'd say, is spend wisely. We think we have to buy all these things. And especially when it comes down to travel, you, you really don't have to spend that much. You can take a few things and you don't need much. And you can really find ways to kind of save money along the way, you know, statravel.org. There's a lot of great websites to save money. And I would just say spend wisely. Those are my top money management tips. So I've traveled a bunch too, not as much as you, but I traveled a bunch too. You kind of figure out along the way whether you need to stay in hotels or hostels, but there's also different things like you can house sit for people. There's different websites where you can actually get free or very cheap accommodations. What would you say were some of the sites or some of the services that you think people really miss out on if they're not using them when they travel and they're really spending too much when they travel abroad? Yeah, I would say TripAdvisor is a great one because you budget, you know, how much you're, you're willing to spend per night for a hotel, cheapest options. It's a great, plus you get the reviews that people put in there themselves. The guests had said about the, you know, the place, the bed bugs, whatever, you can kind of like check that out. So that's a great resource. Airbnb is a great one as well. Couchsurfing.org. STATravel.com is great if you're under 26 or if you're a teacher or a student, you get huge discounts. There's quite a few. And I think, I think those are probably the top ones. I, before this expedition, I use workaway.com and helpex.net and those help free room board. You could kind of like do cool jobs around the world in exchange for free room and board. So then of course, using using a card that helps save on those costs as well. And I, I wasn't, I didn't get much into the whole airline mileage points thing <laughs> with, with airlines because I flew so many different airlines. I did sign up for a few and it did pay off. So I definitely recommend doing that. But yeah, those are kind of my, I, I guess the, the best websites I'd recommend for saving. I have a couple of questions from some listeners who were anxious to get your tips on traveling. One person is going to Scandinavia and and they said that they wanted to get your best tips on how to budget both accommodations and tours to want to go see those cities. So what are the best ways to do that as cheaply as possible? I honestly can't speak for doing tours up there because I didn't do any tours because it was so expensive up there. I mean, it is the, mo- the most expensive area of Europe. What I would say is definitely utilize Airbnb. That's what I did up there. I did stay in a hotel once and it was very small, but very expensive. And I really regret it because Airbnb is so prevalent up there and it is you do end up saving a lot of money and then I would say if you do have some sort of an audience or a following you have a lot of really unique hotels up there that would be willing to have you stay there in exchange for promotion if that's something that you're into or marketing or media and, and so that's that'd be a great option as well but those are that's kind of my only tip I have is really Airbnbs and then doing tours I'd say that I know that in a lot of cities they have these kind of free walking tours that you can participate in and every major city I've been to if you just google free walking tours and then that city, there almost is always one that you can at least participate in to get the overview of the city. Wouldn't you agree? Exactly. You can definitely just kind of walk around. I think they have the hop on hop off buses and you can do you can do that sort of thing. I think there's also group like meetup sites that you can do where, you know, there's a bunch of people going to a certain area and, you know, nature in Norway or something like that. And you can kind of like get in with that group and they have cheap options with that. Maybe Meetup is a great option as well for for getting free kind of tours and kind of meeting new people along the way as well. Yeah, absolutely. And somebody might offer you a room at their place to stay in. And so if you're willing to be a little adventurous, it depends if you're traveling with a family or by yourself. There's a lot of people who are eager to host somebody and to show them around. Another question, food gets very expensive when you travel because a lot of times you're not cooking at home. So what kind of tricks did you learn when it came to food and making sure that you stay fed, but you also weren't paying for expensive dinners every night. So what kind of things did you do to try to minimize your food costs, but also enjoy the local flavor? Food is very important to me, eating healthy. You know, if that meant that I didn't, I couldn't do an activity so that I could eat healthier, I would kind of have the airplane food and, you know, ask them in advance or, you know, on the website, when you go to check in for your flight, I think, you know, if you order vegetarian, it's probably going to be healthy. And that's just one thing that I did on as many flights as I could. So it'd be a little bit of a healthier option. And I'd also save money. On, on having to buy food as well and go to bed early. I mean, I'd have my last meal a day be at like five o'clock, you know, so I'd kind of stick with that healthy lifestyle and that would save me as well. So I wouldn't just be constantly eating all the time. So that kind of makes sense. But yes, yeah, street food is okay. And then also, yeah, if you go to a grocery store as well, 
I think. Yeah, absolutely. You go to the grocery store and I think in a lot of countries, at least in Europe, they usually have some pretty decent lunch specials where you can get several courses for a fixed price versus having to pay a lot for dinner. Yeah, I mean, Europe is very, very easy to eat cheap and and eat well. Uh, I think I'm thinking more of kind of like, you know, Asia and and Africa. You know, I'm like kind of, you got to be a little bit, you you know, yeah, you have to be a little bit unique when trying to think of ways to eat eat healthy and cheaply in in those places as well. So what would you say was the country that surprised you the most and maybe the country that you were most excited to see and maybe the country where you felt you wouldn't recommend people travel there if they haven't been to every other place in the world? Yeah, I think I was the most surprised maybe by, I think Bhutan was really surprising in a good way. I would definitely highly recommend going to Bhutan. It's very interesting and it's really kind of a challenge to get there. You do have to go through a tour and you need $200 a day, everyone to get there for that visa. But once you get there, it's a really peaceful place and there's a lot of unique things to kind of see and experience and feel. And so I would definitely highly recommend that. But the one that I wouldn't go to, I don't really want to talk about that because because I do like to promote the, the, the peace and beauty of all countries. And I really don't like to talk about the ones that I didn't really like so much because I just want to promote the, the goodness. One that really surprised me also was Vanuatu. And Vanuatu is a little tiny sovereign nation in the Pacific. Um, I guess the closest uh, landmass would be Australia. They're so kind over there and just so heartwarming, really genuine people. And it's really sad because they have terrible cyclones that just wipe out everything, all their crops. And But they're just so kind and heartwarming. I spoke to the students there. It was a really, really great experience. So yeah, probably those two countries. And one of our listeners wanted to know, outside of the U.S., which country that you went to would you say is the best to retire in or would you retire in? Probably Switzerland. (laughs) I just love the mountains. It really depends on what you like, you know, what you're into. Cities, mountains, beach, desert. You know, I really love Jordan, but I would probably, probably choose Switzerland. Yeah, well, there you definitely need some money for Switzerland, but it's a safe, beautiful country. What would you say were the greatest lessons you learned through this experience? It's really important to be open-minded and have no preconceptions when you meet someone or when you walk into a new country or when you're looking to go to a completely different country than you've ever been to. If you walk into a country with no preconceptions, you can kind of formulate your own experience. And it ends up being actually a pretty good experience because once you have all these negative annotations in your mindset in regards to a country or its people or its religion or what's happened before, you kind of go in there and you think, oh, what's what's going to happen? It's bad. So what really got me through this whole trip was was just having an open mind, trying to experience the goodness of the people, the kindness of the people, the beauty of the place. In that, I kind of realized that we're just all the... We're all the same and we all have the same basic needs at the end of the day. It doesn't matter financial status or religion or cultural background. We just have the all, all the same basic needs. And that's really the common denominator towards connecting all people and really uniting us. And that's, I think, what made this experience more like such a positive one for me. I mean, I'm a single, young, blonde American woman going to like every country in the world. And to think that I only had like two experiences that were kind of bad, but not so bad. Is really, I mean, it really says something. So, yeah, that's probably what I'd say I've learned. Did you have any issues when it came to cultural communication, when it came to language? I mean, how did you handle some of those issues? Generally speaking, everyone around the world, you can find someone who speaks English. So I didn't find that to be an issue. Um, I do have an international kind of cell phone plan. You know, in most countries around the world, there's data. And so I can kind of pull up my Google Translate app. And a lot of a lot of taxi drivers use that as well. Like in, in the middle of nowhere, they'll pull out Google Translate. I'm like, actually, it's a good idea. So then I downloaded it. So if there's ever a cultural barrier, you can kind of use that or just find like a hotel or a restaurant. And typically someone will speak English. So I didn't find that to be too much of an issue. So I got to just ask you a few questions. What was the crazy experience that you had there? The one that people want to know a story from your trip. It's the first story that kind of pops into your mind. And Libya, maybe. Libya was, you know, what they're going through. And it's it's just not a good situation over there. But it's a beautiful country and got there. And it was they thought I was in the CIA at the border control. I mean, I got there at like midnight and I was like really tired and I needed to have someone meet me there, a tour company meet me there and to make sure everything went okay. And and they're like, we think she's in the CIA. So they kind of detained me there for about an hour and a half. And, you know, we're questioning. I finally got through and kind of like a surreal experience because they weren't, you know, angry about it. I mean, I'd been detained before, but it was kind of like a positive, you know, like an interesting kind of fun. It shouldn't have been fun, but yeah, it kind of experienced very unique. 
different. It turned out okay, so it's a fun story to tell at the end of the day. So I want to go back to when you decided that you were going to do this. So you were a babysitter. You did not have, I'm, I'm guessing you didn't have this huge social media following yet. You weren't this super experienced blogger. You didn't have this amazing network of people who just happened to have cash that they wanted to give you. So how did you generate interest and support and enough publicity in order to lock down some of this funding in order to get an audience that you could, you know, I know a lot of people who blog as they travel. And if they have a big enough audience, they can actually make money while they're doing that and help fund their travel. So how did you go from really not having any of that to getting all of that in order to fund this trip? So I actually stayed away from the blogging scene because I did blogging before and it didn't really work for me. So now I just kind of on this trip, it was more like business focus with, with sea level companies and really, tra- you know, filming a documentary. And that's kind of what I did. So I, I really didn't, couldn't offer them like an article, you know, on my website and views and that sort of sense. And obviously I didn't have the audience either. So what I did that I found to be really crucial in the beginning stages was to have a good solid set of supporters on my, on my website. I just needed them on my website, their name, their picture. And um, so I reached out to, you know, Randall Fines, who's considered the world's greatest living explorer. He's broken tons of Guinness world records. He was the first person to circumnavigate the world along its polar axis. He said no when I first reached out. And then I kind of sulked for a week because he was the first person I ever reached out to. I was like, oh man, who am I? He was, it's like, I'm a, I'm a babysitter living in like, I'm no one right now, you know? So I, then I decided to reach out to him again a couple weeks later and he said yes. So from there, it kind of snowballed. I was, you know, Toby from the office, Paul Liberstein. Uh, I, I saw him on a flight, you know, just in economy flying from LA to New York. And I was waiting in line in the bathroom. And I was like, are you Toby from the office? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, so cool to meet you. You know, I'm doing this expedition. Would you want to be a supporter? And he's like, yeah, sure. So for this sort of thing, it really took like, just breaking down barriers, you know, biting the bullet and just going after what I needed, being really persistent and not caring almost, you know, but also caring very deeply <laughs> to have that set of strong supporters because with those supporters, then I was able to obtain nonprofit endorsement. I reached out to nonprofits for promoting peace and tourism and sustainability. And that's when the International Institute of Peace and Tourism came on board. And then once they came on board, I was invited to networking events and summits and it kind of just really snowballed from there. So it took a lot of networking, a lot of, you know, LinkedIn networking, physical networking, and just getting involved with the organizations and people and just getting yourself out there like that in order to find the funding. So for people that maybe aren't going to do an expedition like this that would get notoriety and, and be able to get funding, but they really, their dream is to, they own their own business or they're a freelancer and they want to work remotely. What advice would you have for them as far as being able to financially make it happen? Is it as difficult as it feels or is it something that you've met along the way, a lot of people who were doing it and it seems pretty feasible? It is feasible. It's completely feasible. It just depends on how badly you want it. How badly do you want to travel? Before this whole trip, I, I was trying to help people travel on a budget, you know, because I, you know, I traveled Europe on like ten dollars a day, and South America five dollars a day, and really, really cheaply. What, what my goal was to go into to hotels and promote sustainable tourism as a sustainability consultant. It really depends on what you want to do. Do you want to be a blogger? Do you want to focus on aid abroad? Do you want to be a travel agent? At the end of the day, there are sites that can really help to offset those costs, such as couch surfing, Airbnb, and all those sites that I mentioned before. Saving money working along the way, starting little side businesses, you know, online selling, selling, you know, crafts that you make, you know, there's, there's ways to make it happen, but it's just a matter of how badly do you want it? Because if you don't want it that badly, it's not going to happen for you. And I'm actually starting a seminar on June 2nd to help people secure funding for their own passion project, the Expedition 26 Entrepreneur, if people are interested in that, but otherwise go over a lot of, a lot of tips on how to secure funding and for whatever passion project you have, if it, even if it's not travel, but there's ways to, to kind of make it happen. But yeah, like I said, it really comes down to drive and then utilizing these tips on how to save money. Tell me again the name of your seminar and how people can access it. So it's called the Expedition 196 Entrepreneur. And there are three course options, um, all different prices, and it's all virtual. So you can just hop online and, and, and do it at your own kind of pace. The Expedition196Entrepreneur.com. And there's also the uh, Instagram, Expedition196Entrepreneur, and Facebook as well. And yeah, just hop on the website and see if it's for you. What I'm going to be doing is funding some of the top projects. Um, I'm kind of acting as their first sponsor to kickstart their project at the end of 
of the full three months seminar. Those who sign up for the full three months um, have that opportunity. So yeah, it's it's my goal to kind of help you know I mean help change the world and support you know support passion projects who are going to change the world as well and and support them financially. So you made a career out of this. You started out not exactly sure what you were going to be doing as your career. You made this happen, and now what is your career as far as like how you generate income and and enough income to also sponsor other people? That's actually going to be in correlation with the nonprofit that I'm working on right now and developing. So there's a nonprofit, there's branding agreements, corporate branding agreements, influencer branding agreements. Also speaking engagements is a a huge way that I'm making um, money at this point. I'm writing a book as well. And I signed with a production company for potentially a TV show. There's the educational documentary that I'm wrapping up editing this year. It should be out next year. And then, of course, merchandise. And there's tons of stuff that's coming from it. I mean, my number one goal after this whole thing was to just have a show on the Travel Channel. <laughs> that was it. But now that I know there's a... I'm like, wow, speaking, branding. There's so many other avenues to go now through through after in the after effects of this. And it's really great. I mean, really, the sky's the limit, I think, when it comes to this sort of thing. Wonderful. So if someone were to come to you today and say they're going to take a certain amount of months off from work to travel, what would be the best financial advice that you could offer them based on your experience? Save a little bit of money to kind of get going. It doesn't have to be a lot. And then I would say just have the basic planning. You know, I would say it depends on what their budget is, but utilize those websites, you know, save a little bit of money and and just really go with it. Have a, have a basic itinerary, but be willing to veer off the beaten path. Is there an area of the world or a certain group of countries where you can kind of get the most bang for your buck? You don't have tons of money, but you really want to do some international travel. You utilize your credit cards well and you can score a free ticket on a flight that actually once you're there, it's extremely cheap. And yet it's also an incredible experience. You know, Europe can be really cheap and it's really easy to get, you know, to travel there. I mean, from America, it's a good starter place to go if you're if you're looking to kind of travel for a little bit. I mean, I wouldn't recommend going to Africa first. Africa is really expensive. The flights are expensive. I mean, it's beautiful, but I wouldn't recommend that. In South America, if you get a good flight, that's a pretty cheap place to go. Central America, that's really cheap to get to, really cheap while you're there, really beautiful if you're a nature person. And then, of course, if you can score a really great flight over to Southeast Asia, that's a great place to go because once you get there, it's fairly cheap as well. Wonderful. And my podcast is called Charged Up. So what charged you up about this incredible experience? I would say just meeting so many cool people and learning so many people's stories, you know, just letting go of preconceptions and just learning people's stories really inspired me along the way and kind of kept me going, you know, learning how people live their lives and what they do to inspire themselves to to live a more fulfilled life. And, and yeah, that's charged me up. Well, fantastic. Cassie, you've charged us up. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be Googling now different flights and different travel plans to get to some of these countries in the world. And there is nothing like travel. And I've always told my friends, you don't need to stay at the expensive places. Just go to the country and you'll probably even have a better time if you stay at more local, cheaper places and meet some of the local people. Yeah, exactly. 100 percent. 100 percent is the way to go. Cassie, thank you so much for joining us today. This was very interesting. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you for joining me for this episode of Charged Up. I'd love it if you could rate and review us on iTunes and subscribe so you're alerted as soon as a new episode is up. If you have questions you want me to answer on air, please send an email to chargedup at creditcards.com. To read the full transcript for each episode and access even more great financial information, head on over to creditcards.com. Until next time, get charged up about your financial future. (laughs) 